Um, <laughs> it's then nice to speak to you. I should say right from the off that I haven't read the book that I wanted to talk to you about. But... I'd be very, very surprised if you had, because it's not out yet. Nobody's read it yet. Well, I've read it, obviously. but Who, Who's read it? Uh, me and the publisher. Publishers. Yeah, I think that's... That's it. Well, you haven't showed it to friends or you haven't showed it. No, to... no. Next, my wife will be the first, but I wanted to get it finished first. So obviously, I do my bit. Then it goes back and forth a few times with the publisher for corrections and things and uh, suggestions. And so we're just kind of at the point now where that's all done. So the next thing is making sure so if all the facts checking's done and references and what have you. And now that we've got the fine tooth uh, comb of spelling mistakes and all that kind of yeah. Crap. But, uh, well, it's the books there, really. Yeah, I, I just I recently finished writing a book, and I have showed it to a few friends, and they got back to me straight away and went, "Oh, that thing you said about me is really nice." And I went, "Oh, okay, cool. Uh, have you read the rest of it?" And they were like, "No, I'm, I'm <laughs> working yeah. through it, you know." Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. But I should say that I have read "Leave the Capital," which I think is one of the like one of the best music books I've ever ever read. Thank um, you very much. Yeah, what a book that is. Uh, I haven't read the book that's after that, but I am a I am a full fan, so I feel like I know a lot of that stuff. But mm -hmm. why why the Buzzcocks? Well, first of all, can I just stop you there? It's not the Buzzcocks. It's Buzzcocks. <laughs> okay, right. Us, us people who write books about Buzzcocks are very, you know, very uh, keen to stress that it's Buzzcocks, not the Buzzcocks. What, so, uh, yeah, so why, why Buzzcocks? Why does, that, why does that matter so much? I say this is a so my favorite band are the Ramones, right? And yeah, they are. They 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 are. Ah, that's a weird one, that because they don't put Ramones on the logo, do they? But people, everyone calls them the Ramones. Yeah, yeah. It's the same with like Pixies. You know, like I love the Pixies, but I, yeah. I, you know, they say Pixies. I used to work at the NME, and the subs on the subs desk were yeah. so. Remember them subs? Remember when people used to read articles and make sure they made sense? <laughs> yeah, it was great, great days. They, yeah, the mo. I'm. I have OCD, like diagnosed OCD, so I have real problems with spelling mistakes and grammatical errors. Like it, mm -hmm. it, it, it's not just irritating to me; it's actually like psychologically distressing. And having yeah. worked at, at magazines as subs were gradually being. Uh, phased out. Found that hard work. I'll be honest. It's murder, isn't it? It's so you just completely and utterly takes you out of the writing, doesn't it? When you see something like you know some egregious bloody yeah. grammatical error. But anyway, will, so yeah, the reason I'll, it's important because I'll it was important to Pete Scott, Shelley. You know. Yeah, it was. It was the. Re it was important to Pete Shelley. He used to always say in interviews, "There is no definite article because buscocks are the definite article." So that's why it's it's important to him. So it's important to me really. That, Less important. It's not really important at all, but in the grand scheme of things. But yeah, these things are important. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and drop the the for the for the, for the. Of this conversation. <laughs> yeah. I won't, I won't point it out again. If you do it again, I'll, I'll, I will let it slide. Otherwise, it could, it could be a bit. No, I'm gonna do anal. my best. I'm gonna do my best. So, why buzzcocks? Well, the the reason is because I love the band, and they were kind of my band. There's a certain point in your life, probably in a male's life, if we're going to be honest. I mean, obviously, there's loads of yeah. fanatical, but it's a 14 to 16, that at that time of your life where you have a favourite band. Because, I mean, it's a bit of a ridiculous notion, isn't it, to have a, famous, a favourite band, that you just buy everything as the day it comes out and you go and see them every time they play anywhere near you. And I don't think that can last. It kind of finished early for me. Because I was in the fall, who we were obviously the most cynical band on earth, so the concept of a famous band didn't really fly then. So I just yeah. wanted to, I wanted to talk, talk about that point where that relationship to, between a young adolescent and a band is at its most intense, and then why it happens, why it fizzles out, and then to do that, I obviously had to tell the story of the band as well. So then it, that became like enough, enough of a concept to write a book about because. I did think about writing just a biography of Pete Shelley, but then I wasn't in it then. And I like to be in my writing. I like it, you know, because I know it's a, it's, it's a bit of a cliche that in the end you're always writing about yourself. But you're not, are you? If you write, if you if you are taking pains to do an objective biography, then you're deliberately taking yourself out of the story. And I didn't want to do that, so I'm in there. I, I kind of got the impression from reading the blurb that 
whilst this was a book about buzzcocks, it also was you were using the buzzcocks to a uh, to a almost have a treatise on the glory of teenage pop fandom, but also yes. kind of tell your story as well. I am in there. I, it, um, yeah, I am. It felt it felt cheating to take me out, really. I and mean, it did feel like taking me out, you know, because I, I I did go into it with every intention of writing a Buscox biography, but it became apparent that I I was taking myself out of it because, like, you know, he's writing about an album. It's, I find it very difficult to write about another music in a different kitchen without any opinion. I, I couldn't do that in a million years, so I thought, yeah. well, I'll, I'll lean into it then. And when I had discussions with the publisher after I first started, he kind of said, you know. This is the book you, you should be writing about your relationship with the band, not just the story of the band. I mean, in some ways, straight biographies, they got kind of, you don't really need them anymore, do you? With the internet and Wikipedia and everything yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. Just telling this happened and then this happened, it becomes a bit pointless, really. Yeah, I also think as well, there was something, like I had the good fortune of, of meeting Pete a couple of times uh, and. There was definitely something in Buzzcock's music that was about youth, you know, even if it was like yeah. young fumblings, you know, there was a lot of that. Yeah, well, yeah, I, yeah. I think he had the ability to put himself back into that space yeah. of a 16-year-old. Yeah. I mean, self-evidently a 16-year-old uh, throughout his career, really. Yeah, And it yeah. meant that he could, go, he could go back and use songs that he'd written when he was 15 and, you know, even, up, you know, um, uh, Telephone Operator, which was... was this like second big solo hit. He'd written that when he was a you know a teenager, so he was able to go back and it still validate what he thought when he was a teen a, a spotty teenager throughout his life, which is quite it's quite an ability, I think. So, were you as a fan? Were you writing at the beginning? No, no, not at all. I, I am the day the way I tell it in the book. The day another music in a different kitchen came out, Steve went to the they had this launch at Virgin. Records. I don't know if you remember Virgin Records in Manchester, the back when sort of record shops were kind of yeah. like hangouts, really. But they had this this thing where they launched the album and they did this balloon release, and you won a prize if you you were the furthest away. You sent the card attached. So Steve was at that, and he bought the album the day it came out, and he brought it home. Now in my head, I listened to it that day, and they became my favourite band. I'm sure it wasn't quite as. Well, it was, it was pretty much, it wasn't far off. And I also, you know, um, it, they coincided with me starting to play the drums as well. So it, it kind of all gets mixed up, really, because uh, they had my favourite drummer in the world, or one of my favourite drummers in the world, John Marr, yeah. who I, can, you know, mercilessly ripped off for years. So it was, yeah, it was, it was. so then I was working forward and backwards, if you like, because Steve had spiral scratch. And he had orgasm on it. It's, it's the beauty of having an older brother. It is, yeah. I've always said it. Every decent bit, of, well, not just. I've come to realise not just Steve. I've got another older brother, Harry, and he was it more into sort of you know singer songwriters, Elton John and things. And uh, I've kind of got realised that they're kind of in my DNA a bit now. I've listened to um, a while back. I listened to Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, and I did. I, I was completely stunned to find out I knew the album pretty much all the way through. So I must have been listening to it at some stage. But yeah, so it is the beauty of an older brother. They make they make all the big decisions for you, don't they? So when, you know, obviously you were, uh, you know, for a period of time in a, you know, extremely influential and adored Manchester band, when did you first cross paths with the Buzzcocks physically? Um, so let's see. The first time I saw them... Would be they played Alexandra Park, and that was a big, another big moment in my life. They played there uh, for various reasons. They played a, a Rock Against Racism festival in Alexandra Park, and the four were involved in that. They didn't end up playing in the end. They were supposed to be playing, but they, they didn't. They ended up playing at a different venue on a different night. So, because I, they all rehearsed in the same place, it, 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 it sounds ridiculous, but to be what, one step removed from the Manchester music scene was pretty easy in 1978. So, because Buscocks, Joy Division. Uh, uh, or they all rehearsed in the same place, and the fall they all rehearsed in this place called TJ Davidson's, which was like a shithole. Basically, it was a, one of them big old mills right in the centre of Manchester, and he he must have spent in excess of two pounds doing it up between a, between being a warehouse and being a rehearsal room. Yeah, uh, so it was a real dump. Uh, you can see if you watch the video for 
Love Will Tear Us Apart. Oh, that's is that it? Right, yeah. yeah that's, that's T.J. Davidson's, yeah. And that was yeah. the poshest room in the place. So, so Buzzcocks had a rehearsal room there. The Fall rehearsed there. Joy Division rehearsed there. They just hide the room by the day. And the, the Fall used to let you go along and watch them rehearse because uh, that uh, I went to see the Fall rehearse before even Steve was in. And when Mark Riley was a bass player, I went to see the Fall rehearse. And the, there was a cafe just down the road. And... The fall went for a cup of tea and Buscox came in. And Steve Garvey gave me a badge. So that was the first time I met them. And then we made kind of made it our business. We used to go to John Ma because John Ma went to the same school as me. Another reason he's one of my sort of heroes. Uh, yeah. And he lived just around the corner. So we went at lunchtime or after school, knocked on his front door. How we got his address, I'm not quite sure, actually. But we got his address. I thought maybe it was in the school records or something. I don't know. But um, knocked on his door and he was dead nice. And then we did the same with Pete Shelley. In, he had a house in Gorton, knocked on his door. He wasn't quite so nice. We got him out of bed. But they were just there, you know. They were not They were physically nearby and mentally nearby. Because I think, you know, that's the big... I know it's a bit... That's another cliche that it kind of broke down the barriers between bands and, and fans, punk. Yeah, But yeah. It, it very, very, very uh, evidently did in Manchester. The, you know, you'd see people there... You know, you'd be in a club and Pete Shelley would be there or Ian I, Curtis would be there, you know. And so it, like, it became, that, that became easier. I feel like it must be, I feel like it must be something in the in the water, as they say, about Manchester, though, because there's always that story about Johnny Marr turning up at Morrissey's house. Like, do you yeah. just, did, did, did none of you ever call each other? Do you just turn up? At well, well, yeah, you see, that's interesting on that because... People weren't on the phone, but you forget that. Howard Devoto knocked on John Marr's door to get him to join the band. People didn't have phones. You know, a I lot mean, of the time. I mean, look, I'm 43, but I definitely remember there being phones in the 80s. There was phones. We, we, we There was phones, of course, but not everybody had one. Not everybody was on the phone, and you, you, not, you couldn't, it wasn't that easy to get people's number. It wasn't that, you know, yeah, like give yeah, me a mobile. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, people did knock on people's doors. As well. I, I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make it out. It's like, you know, where's my whippet and, you know. <laughs> The deprivation and outside toilets. When the word outside toilets, but no, no, the, the, knocking on people's doors was definitely a thing. But that we, that was uh, us being ultra fans, me and my friends at school. We found out where they lived and went to the house. Well, what else could you do? You weren't going to go on the yeah. web page, were you? Yeah, no. But, well, in fairness, my dad's uh, my dad, he's not around anymore, but he was from Oldham, and he would when he would tell the story of his childhood, he it, it, he did make it sound like. Uh, he did make it sound like there were whippets on it on on every corner. Um, with this is a tough question. Obviously, you were in the fall. Obviously, that band did and does matter to you. I mean, you do a podcast about the fall. Um, do you did you like the Buscocks more than you liked the fall? The way I describe it in the book, and it's going to be difficult to convey this, uh, but not on the printed pages. I loved. Joy Division, I loved the fall, but I loved Buzzcocks. <laughs> so it's it's a it's a italic in the book. There's, right. a, there's a love of a yeah. band and there's the love of a band. You know that that's that's the difference. I mean, I could you couldn't I couldn't have done that level of fandom of the fall because I, you know I've known Matt Riley all my life. It would have been ridiculous to be a fanboy of the fall in some ways. But, yeah. Uh, no, they, 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 I I could sort of say they meant Buzzcocks meant more to me. Not to say they're a more important band, or not to say they're a less important band in a lot of ways, but they, they did definitely, but for that period of time, they definitely meant more to me. I I, I say this, on the, I talk about this on the podcast quite a lot, actually. Like, The Fall are one of my favourite bands, and I had the opportunity to interview Mark at one point, and I, they're one of about three bands I ever, like, chickened out speaking to, because I was just a bit mm -hmm. intimidated. I was like... Yeah? I was like, I'm not... I felt like I wasn't clever enough. That, that you know, that's an admission from me there. So that's I, that's pretty much sums my relationship with him. I was intimidated by him and felt like I wasn't clever enough as well. And I was in the band for the best part of five years, so I, you know, well, that was, was how he made people feel. Yeah, yeah, I've heard this. What I guess kind of my, that's my preamble to asking: What did Mark think of the Buzzcocks? I I almost wonder I, whether. Yeah, go on. I don't think he was massively impressed with them as a musical entity. I think he respected them, and he certainly was certainly grateful for the get, the help they gave in the early days. I think yeah. um, they had a bit of a 
him and Kay had a bit of a thing about selling out that they thought the the buscock they thought that buscocks had done right. by going on to UA and getting like you know uh, proper photo sessions and you know makeup and you know really taking care of the sleeves and you know yeah. kind of all that kind of thing. Which Buscock Bus got kind of leaned into it in a way because you know the, the the first album was released and it had a carrier bag on it with products and they put like the, you know that they were selling it you know uh, yeah. but um, so yeah I don't, he always said they were like Freddie and the Dreamers which they clearly weren't like Freddie and the Dreamers but uh, no I, but I think he was a he was a bit distrustful of pop in some ways anyway Mark. yeah yeah so yeah but yeah I don't think I don't think he was particularly a fan of those. he I mean obviously the Buscocks reunite 90 89 but 89 yeah yeah the first time round, i mean it's like a blink of an eye really um, it is yeah it's nothing i mean they had two albums out in 1978 they had two albums out yeah you know, I mean, not it's... not like right at the beginning right at the end either you know the the, the the work rate was just i mean for all of them bands you know they hit the clash they just completely burnt themselves out you know it was just it's an unhealthy way to go about your business i think I mean, I know I know enough about punk to know about you know the free trade hall and you know Buscock's mm-hmm. involvement in, in in setting that up and such like. But how how important were they to to Manchester music in that window? I think they were absolutely crucial to it, really. And you know, I've talked about it. I talk about it in Leave the Capital that thing where you say, "All right, it's all happening in London." Well, let's not have it all happening in London. Let's let's bring it to Manchester. Which Buscocks did, you know, they could have said, "Well, we've got whatever amount of money, let's just do it. You spend it following the sex pistols around." But they didn't. He said, "Let's get them to Manchester," and then the two. I mean, it, again, it gets romanticised, but those two gigs and the gap in between changed the whole kind of culture of the town. In it, eventually, without being too wanky about it, they did. You know, the whole rena- cultural renaissance of Manchester, in some ways, is indebted to the people who went to those shows and thought, well, I'm going to do something. Because, again, it sounds ridiculous, but, you know, Tony Wilson, Joy Division, Rob Gretton, these are movers and shakers in kind of transform, transforming Manchester in a way. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, it could have, you know, it might have happened, and it probably would have happened more organically, I think, but it was like a kickstart. So it was like a flicking a switch because it ha- they had the two things happen so close together. So I guess the logical next question is, what was it like when they disbanded? Well, it's, that's one of the things I talk, talk about in the book, really, is by the time Buscox disbanded at 81, I was in the fall then, and they had become less of an obsession because it wasn't... It was, well, I, I was probably ready for it anyway, but it wasn't really that kind of fandom wasn't something that had a lot of purchase in the fall. People, we, we were very kind of standoffish in a lot of ways about any kind of music, yeah, and so kind of cynical about it to yeah. the to the, to a ridiculous degree in some ways, you know. But whereby I guess... you know you'd be sorry, go on. No, no, go on. Sorry, man. I was just going to say to the point whereby you'd be stood in a room with someone you admired, and you'd you'd be at pains to not show that you admired them or that they were, you thought they were great or anything, which is you know, it's ridiculous, yeah. isn't it? Hey, listen. I I spent a lot of time in Sunderland, and I was involved in quite a exciting music scene. This sort of start of the noughties, and uh, there's so much when I hear stories from people like yourself when you talk about being within a music scene that just go. I think it's just generational. Like it just keeps going. Yeah, I, there were so many things where it was like. Oh, I don't like that band, but actually, really, what it is, I'm jealous that they're doing more than us. And yeah, all yeah, that, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, there was a lot of that. I mean, they're, they're slight Brit pop, you know. There, there was, that was one of the things that, you know, Marky e. Smith would be contemptuous of other musicians, but you know, without being funny, he had far more in common with them than he ever had with you know the people he purported to have. You know, he spent his whole he was in a band his whole life. You know, that was all he did. Yeah. So you know, to send say I've got nothing in common with other people who all they do is in a band, it, it, it takes some kind of force of will to do that. I think. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was funny. I, mean, I suppose it's part of it was part of Mark's appeal. But I, I will always remember there's some award show where Pavement get up and they start talking about the fall, and then yeah. I remember him kind of letting rip on Pavement. And yeah, well, I mean, that was the worst thing you could possibly do. I think for Mark was to say you like the fall because <laughs> you, you, he was immediately a you then. Yeah, absolutely. You know, 
Yeah. Um, how do you feel? Actually, I should say I interviewed uh, Diggle a couple of years ago, Steve Diggle. Oh, yeah. How do you feel about them carrying on without Pete Shelley? Well, for me, I think it, it felt ridiculous, to be honest. But I spoke to a number of people for the book, including, uh, you know, his partner and John Marr and Steve Garvey. And uh, all of them said he's got every right to do it. And if you look at it, I mean, you know, if anybody's got a right to sing Pete Shelley songs, it'd be Steve Diddley. I mean, he's been in there. How long has he been in there? He's been in there since right at the beginning, pretty much. And you know, yeah. he's got every right to do it. If you if you look at it dispassionately, I mean, it's never gonna it's never gonna uh, it's never gonna fly for me, really. Or you know, but um, I don't, and what what's it got to do with me? <laughs> he's got. Yeah. I think he has got every right to carry on. Yeah, yeah. I think that's how I felt actually. I went to speak yeah. to him for a piece in the wake of in the wake mm-hmm. of passing, and I I, I sort of. I wanted a little bit more. I wanted a little bit more what Pete Shelley meant to him, and a little bit mm-hmm. less. Oh, we're actually going to reunite next year. Yeah, yeah. But you know, I don't know if you if you do your time. I mean, people have got to make a living, aren't they? So I'm, yeah, yeah. I try, well, I try if, you look, if you look at it that dispassionately, it's what he does, you know. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Was there anyone that you wanted to speak to for the book, but you couldn't get to? Uh, Richard Boone. I- I kind of asked a couple of times, but his, his health wasn't so great, and I, I got the impression he didn't really want to do. Which it wasn't. It wasn't a massive problem in the way. I deliberately didn't speak to Steve Diggle because I thought, in telling the story of Buscox, it's kind of the story of Pete and Steve, and I obviously couldn't speak to speak to speak to Pete. And then I thought, well, if what if I speak to Steve Diggle and I get, I mean, I really like him, and then I can't do my opinion, if you like, uh, you know, I, I start thinking, well, I won't put that in because he wouldn't like it or whatever. And I thought that that's not, that's not the way. It goes. So I, he was the one I deliberately didn't speak. More, more, pretty much everyone else I got to speak to. Who I wanted to. Did he speak to Howard? I did, but only via, via email, a couple of emails. Right. But um, I, was, I was obviously interested in that bit, but, you know, they were less my band, the Howard DeVoe or Buscox, than yeah. the... the Steve Garvey, Buscox, if you like. So, yeah, I, I, I did speak to him and I asked him a couple of key things that I wanted to know about, but it wasn't, that wasn't the main story I was telling anyway. So, I always feel like with Pete Shelley and Howard DeVoto that it's like, it's like when you know people who are in a relationship and it, and they break up and you're like, well, they, they've got chan- they've got a chance to be happy with other people now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, I love magazine. I, I wouldn't. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I, I think it would have. Yeah, the thing about it is, it would have been a, a travesty if Pete hadn't become the front man of a band, wouldn't it? If yeah. he'd have been Absolutely. Howard Devoto side man for the whole of his career, that would have been that wouldn't have been right, and it wouldn't have served Pete properly. And I think I, I think Howard Devoto was better served in magazine than he was in Buscox in some ways. He was kind of playing a role in Buscox, sort of Johnny Rotten Light in a lot of ways. Yeah, and yeah. He, it was only when he formed magazine that he became the artist that he was supposed to be, I suppose. Tell me a bit about the sleeve. I mean, that's amazing. What, the sleeve of the book? Yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, well, part of the, and there's something I go into it fairly lengthy, but uh, in the book is the appeal, the aesthetic appeal of Buscox, because, you know, that book, that, al- that bringing that album home and the music in different kitchen and its sleeve and it had the insert and it had a silver carrier bag and badges. Badges were just. These, this is just. Yeah, I've still got all my Buscox badges. I've still got them in a drawer, kept, kept safe in a drawer. Oh, they, they, that was a massive part of the appeal for, for me. I mean, I would, uh, uh, Malcolm Garrett was kind of I, in my head. He was kind of like the fifth member in the way, in some ways. I just yeah. seeing that, and you know that sleeve. Certainly, like there's, there's a couple of things like "Love You More." I just thought that was the nicest thing I'd ever seen. That sleeve when the day I got that, the day it came out, and it had that pink sleeve and the badge, and it was just the whole thing was just, I mean, ridiculous, really. So, but um, I got to know him. He liked Leave the Capital. Uh, we got we got talking a few times at various events and things, and I got to the point, and I thought I've got to ask him. I've got to ask him, even yeah. if he says don't be ridiculous, I'm not doing that. But at least I've asked him. Yeah. And then so I said, you know. Obviously, I won't take offence if you don't want to do it, and I, you know, and he, and then he kind of said, "Well, I'd have, I'd have took offence if you hadn't asked me." In a way, so it was just oh, nice. I wasn't going to turn that down. 
Isn't, isn't there because he, he showed me the sleeve and said, Do you like it? And I said, I think it's amazing. But then, to be honest, it would have to be spectacularly shite before I'd say I don't like that sleeve. And it obviously, it clearly isn't. It clearly isn't. It's amazing. I, I have interviewed a few bands on the podcast, actually, but I've interviewed a few bands over the years that they asked Storm Ferguson, you know, the sleeve designer, yeah, yeah. to do sleeves for them. And what he gave mm-hmm. them, they thought was quite shit. But right. they, they didn't dare tell him that mm-hmm. yeah but I can, you know i can see that <laughs> yeah it's a bit hit and miss you know but, yeah yeah uh, no please it works out for you i did see is it the pre-orders that get a badge that felt very buzzcox yeah we've got a badge we've got a badge that, oh, that's <sighs> come on these things I've got matter. a badge designed by malcolm gillett these things matter so is they it do. So, is the book is it general release april and but there's pre-orders hey. in december that's right yeah no, november december yeah you can get it from the publisher and then yeah April it'd be out in the shops. Amazing, amazing. I feel a little mm. bit like this should be a film. I, again, I haven't read it, but I just feel like there's. Uh, in fact, I think I think actually Diggle did say something to me about how someone had approached him about a Buzzcock series, which you know, I mean, right. I, we were in the pub, like we drank a, a bit. You know, I don't know how much <laughs> of this. I don't know how much of the, this was the bravado that I think that Steve Diggle can can portray sometimes, but uh, no, yeah. yeah the, it's not bad at a bit of self-aggrandizement on occasion, is it? I think that might be... Is that a Manchester thing or is it a Steve Diggle thing? You'll have to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> right, OK. Well, listen, listen, Paul, I think that's a, a really nice place to leave it. Thanks so much for giving me your time. And I, I should say that your full po- podcast, Oh Brother, which wasn't... Uh, it wasn't something I even knew about until a little bit ago. I think it's amazing. And thank, thank, you. You, for, thank you for writing such brilliant books and telling the Manchester music story. Thank you very much. No, that's very nice of you to say so. No, it's been a pleasure. Amazing. Thank man. you very much. Speak to you okay. again, I'm sure. See you later, dude. Cheers, Bye. mate. Take care.